Hello and welcome to Theology Still Matters. My name is William Hemsworth. It is my honor and my privilege as always to be here with you all. Uh, tonight's topic is Justin Martyr and the landscape of second century apologetics. Now, I know the second century was a long time ago, but some of the things we're going to look at lay the foundation for Christian apologetics today. So we're going to look kind of detail about the environment of the time you know, just in, in, and how the second century apologists kind of countered the accusations that they were encountering. Um, one of the main people we're going to look at is uh, Justin Martyr. Now, in the second century, Christians were still a minority in the general population. And in spite of accusations and persecution, Christianity was growing rapidly. And one of the responses that to the persecute the Roman persecution was the production of works of apologetics. Now these works were not apologizing for the faith, but apologetics gets its name from the Greek word apologia, which mean, literally means defense. Now Justin Martyr was seeking to educate the population about the faith. He um, wanted to prove that Christians were no threat to the general population, but above all he wanted to evangelize for the kingdom. Now, second century apologetics and apologists, including Justin Martyr, used several strategies to defend and spread Christianity, many of which are very effective today. Um, many, of, many of these guys were converts um, who came to the faith after a lot of searching. They, you know, in case of Justin Martyr, he searched many different philosophical systems, which we'll see later on. But above all, they used terms that the general population would understand. Now, Roman society and ancient Greek society was heavily influenced by philosophy and reason. And during this time, a lot of the philosophical terms of Christianity um, sprouted, like logos, which is the word meaning Christ. Now, the Roman government saw Christianity as a challenge to their very way of life. Now, as a result, there were many charges levied against the Christians, um, but there were four that took precedence, and those were cannibalism, atheism, incest, and conspiracy to overthrow the government. Now, to those of us today, these things may seem spurious and ridiculous, but in ancient Rome, it's like if a general in the army joined the Taliban. That's a big deal. Now, all of these charges need a little bit of explaining because in some of these cases, the meanings in ancient times mean something different today. Now, for a complete understanding of apologetics, the apologetics of Justin Martyr, we just need to look at the background of some of these charges by the Romans. Now, in Roman times, as in our time, incest is defined as sexual intercourse between persons too closely related for normal marriage. This charge from Roman officials stems from Christians calling themselves, calling each other brother and sister. Now in today's society, we understand what Christians mean by this term. But in ancient Rome, Christianity was in its infancy and words that Christians used were very often misunderstood. Now, in regard to this charge, uh, church historian Everett Ferguson comments, quote, Incest may have been suggested by Christians referring to each other as brother and sister, with men and women sharing the common table at the love feast, or the Lord's Supper. Now, the charge of cannibalism is a bit more serious than the charge of incest. Now, as we know, cannibalism is the act of eating something of the same species, in the case of uh, human beings, it is the act of eating the flesh of another human. Seems simple enough, right? Now, the Roman belief is that the Christians ate the flesh of their God. And since Christ was also fully a man, the charge of, cannibal of cannibalism came about. Now, this charge is in relation um, to the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, okay? In, in which the memorial of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection are remembered with the breaking of bread. Now, as we will see, Justin Martyr will masterfully answer, the, answer this charge. The charges of incest and cannibalism, though, 
uh, were misunderstood by the Romans in regard to Christians. They kind of have a similar meaning today, though. Now, the charge of atheism is one that needs some explanation. So we all know that atheist is someone who does not believe in the existence of God. An apologist James Bilby takes it one step further and states, quote, An atheist has come to believe that God does not exist, and that therefore all religious traditions are, at their core, false. Now the Roman government had state-sanctioned gods that were they were required to be worshipped, and among those gods were the emperor himself, which provides a whole other obstacle for Christians. It goes without saying that Christians most definitely believed in God, but since they did not sacrifice to the pagan gods of the Roman Empire, the Roman government looked at them as atheists. Now, in his first apology, Justin Martyr puts it best when he says, quote, Hence we are called atheists, and we confess that we are atheists, so far as the gods of this sort are concerned, but not with respect to the most true God, the Father of righteousness, temperance, and the other virtues, who is free from all impurity. Now, the Christians were also charged with what amounts to treason today. Now, basically, they were accused of wanting to overthrow the Roman government. And this charge came about because they did not want to pay homage to the emperor or sacrifice to the Roman gods. And because they didn't do that, they were considered dissenters. And the Romans looked upon them as not wanting to participate in the basic functions of society. And Everett Ferguson writes, quote, These and other charges were readily believed about Christians because they kept themselves removed from the normal functions of society. Now, there were other charges levied against the Christians. And there was an image known as the Alexamenos Graffito. And its image, this image defects, depicts a man with the head of a donkey hanging on a cross. There's another man raising his hand in worship. And this image was found in Rome and depicts, it depicts Christians as dumb because they're worshipping a man that was crucified. And in addition, the image of the donkey was considered a pagan symbol at the time and depicted that the Christian religion was closed, unlike the pagan temples which were open to the public. Now the Christian rebuttal to these charges came in a variety of ways. Many apologists rose to the challenge in the second century, but none of them were as popular then as today as Justin Martyr. And to understand the apologetics of, the apologetics of Justin it may be helpful to look, just talk, briefly talk about um, his life. Uh, he was born in 100 AD to pagan Greek parents. He had a great education which included philosophy, rhetoric, poetry, and history. He studied various philosophical systems, including Stoicism, uh, then Pythagoreanism, then Platonism. But he still was not satisfied and continued on his search for the truth. Now, he'd heard of Christian martyrs, and he was intrigued by their willingness to die for their faith. The testimony of the martyrs planted a seed in the heart of Justin, and his heart would be open to the gospel. Now, he came across a fellow philosopher who started to talk to him about Jesus, and how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies set forth in the Jewish scriptures. He continued to wear the philosopher's cloak because it allowed him to discuss Jesus with the intellectuals of his day. He engaged in various debates with other philosophers, Jews, and other non-Christians. He also opened a school in Ephesus and eventually one in Rome. And his writings live on today and are great material for the church historian, theologian, and apologist. Some of his writings are lost, but ones that we do have include the First Apology, Second Apology, and the, his dialogue with Trypho. Now he was he was arrested, he was tried for his faith, and he was executed along with six of his students for not denying Christianity. Now, earlier in the podcast we briefly described what atheism meant to the Roman government. And according to theologian and philosopher Peter Kreft, atheism is defined as the denial that God exists. We we discussed that already. Now, with this being said, it seems ludicrous that Christians should be should have a charge levied against them. Now, however, according to the Roman government, the charge of atheism is, is valid if one does not worship the state gods. We also discussed that. 
And in response to the charge of atheism, Justin Martyr readily admits that Christians are atheists in the eyes of the Roman government. In his first apology, he tells the emperor that Christians believe in one God, who is the creator of all things and the Lord of all things. Justin also echoes the same sentiment in his dialogue with Trifo, which he states, quote, There is no other God, Trifo, nor was there from eternity any other but he who made the universe. Nor do we think there is one God for us and another for you, but that he alone is God who led your fathers out of Egypt. Nor have we trusted in any other, for there is no other but him. For that very reason, Christians in the second century were called atheists, and Justin wrote to the emperor in his first apology saying that this was an unjust charge. And as we just as I just read, he just, he made that same claim with Trifo. If the Romans do not accept the Christian God, then the Christians will proudly be called atheists. That's the bottom line. Christians were also charged with incest. And as previously stated, this sounds like a crazy, insane charge. But the landscape of the second century was much different than today. Christianity was just start, you know, a couple hundred years old. And just like today, Christians refer to each other as brother and sister. The Romans did not understand and saw married couples participating in this practice. The Romans often confused Christians with the Gnostic sect that was sexually immoral. Justin Martyr took a different approach with this charge than he did with the charge of atheism. In his second apology, Justin writes, quote, For myself, when I learned of this wicked disguise, which, through false report, was cast over the divine teachings of Christians by evil demons in order to turn away others, I laughed at this disguise and at the opinions of the multitude. Hope you kind of heard his tone was much more serious and he was very dismissive. Christians refer to themselves in this way not because they're related by ancestry, but by their spiritual ancestry. Christians are related by faith and not by the flesh. It is the blood of Christ that brings Christians into one family. And they are related to each other only in the manner in which Christ, what Christ has done for them. Justin goes on to say that the Roman accusers should look at the morally upright lives that the Christians are living. If they do, they will see that this charge has no merit. Now about the charge of incest, R.C. Sproul explains, quote, They were also accused of incest for calling one another brother and sister and for meeting in secret, though it was persecution that made private gatherings necessary. To answer these critics, Justin exhorted Emperor Antonius Pius to look at how Christians lived. Since they feared God, Justin said, Christians, Christians could be trusted to obey Roman law lest they incur divine wrath. Justin also asked Pius to study Christian sexual behavior carefully, for the believer's upright ethic proved their goodness. Now, the charge of cannibalism was meant to be demeaning, and it was a capital offense in 2nd century Rome. The charge was going to be used as proof of the historicity of Christianity in modern-day apologetics. The charge of cannibalism stems from Eucharistic language about Christians eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ. That can be seen in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 more specifically. In a loving way, Justin defends this charge in his first apology. Without mentioning the Last Supper narratives or John chapter 6 or 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he explains the Christian position. He not only makes it offense, but weaves in a gospel presentation. It's almost as if his tone becomes more serious, though loving, when it comes to the Lord's Supper. He understands that he is speaking of the Lord's Supper and the sacrifice for sin that it represents. He writes, quote, For not by common bread nor common drink do we receive these, but since Jesus Christ our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too as we have been taught, the food has been made into Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him, and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nurtured. It is both the flesh and the blood of that incarnated Jesus. Now Justin masterfully describes why Christians are being charged, 
He describes the deity of Christ and his sacrifice in just a few short sentences. He does it in a way that non-believers would also understand. He explains why the charge of cannibalism occurred, and that, and that is that the Lord's Supper Christians partake in the memorial of the body and blood of Christ. He elaborates on his deity so the emperor understands that they are not eating a person during their assemblies. Justin also explains that the reason they do it is because it came from Christ himself as a command to do so. Another charge that was levied against the Christians is that of conspiracy to overthrow the government. These and other charges were exacerbated because Christians did not participate in everyday society. You know, they, didn't go to the glad, they didn't go to the gladiator games, things like that. The popular events of the day, such as politics to entertainment like the games, were intertwined with idolatrous acts, such as burning incest and homage of the emperor. Christians were trying to preserve their piety, lessen their temptation, and stay safe during persecution. Their assemblies were closed because only believers could partake in the Lord's Supper. The exclusive nature of this event led to fears of conspiracy. Now, Justin Martyr and other apologists of the second century gave a clear account for the beliefs of the faith. Justin did not sit and let the beliefs of Christians be abused in the public square. He took accusations and gave a clear and reasonable explanation in an attempt to prove them false. He explained that there is only one God and Christians will refuse to worship the Roman gods. He explained the nature of the Lord's Supper to combat the charge of cannibalism. Justin pointed to the morality of the Christian life as a way to falsify the charge of incest. Justin tells the emperor in Trifo that we are to emulate the life of the Savior in everything we do because Christ is King, Priest, God, Lord, Angel, and Man. Jesus is everything, basically. That's from his first apology. So how can the apologetic style of Justin Martyr and the second century apologists be, be used in the churches today? Justin Martyr was direct in that he did not try he didn't he didn't try to circle around an answer. He didn't try to circle around to find time to formulate an answer. He answered directly, even at the risk of offending. Now oftentimes people respect us more if we're direct than we than if we're not. People just want a straight answer most of the time. Justin explained the faith using the language of the people. He lived among philosophers and spoke about Christianity in a philosophical way. Because that was his audience. We need, we need to gauge our audience and not speak down to them, and at the same time, not speak above them. We need to speak in a way that our audience can understand. That's what Justin Martyr did. Now, this ensured that Justin's audience knew exactly what he was saying, and they can make the conscious decision to believe it or not. Lastly, Justin lived what he believed. We can speak all day about Christ, but if we're not living the Christian life, if we're not living it out, others will see and may not believe. Justin and many Christians of the second century paid the ultimate price for their faith. They lost their lives, but at the same time that meant they lived it. They lived their faith. Now to conclude this podcast, the, meth- the methods that Justin Martyr used to defend and evangelize are still useful today. Now, obviously, the pagan gods um, are not the pagan Roman gods are not an issue, but there's other things like the New Age movement. You know, there's other in some countries paganism and pantheism is still an issue. Um, how many people? How many people do you see looking at their cell phones all day long? What's their priority in life? Like Justin, we can point to the immorality of those who claim to be divine, and point to morality, to point to the morality of Christians. Spreading the faith and using simple terms is more important than ever before. Justin used the language and style of the people, and we need, we need to learn to do the same. We must recognize that we're not 
dealing with fellow seminary students and a lot of people out there they haven't heard of the terms that some of us may be familiar with like Justin we must study our faith live our faith speak about our faith and we must be willing to die for our faith guys That's authentic, and that is what this hurting world needs. They need more authentic Christians like Justin, who are willing to live it and teach it. Well, God bless you guys. My name is William Hemsworth. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in to this episode of Theology Still Matters. God bless you guys. (laughs) 